The next speaker is uh, Paul Linden. Um, Paul, uh, like me, grew up in Australia, although I think you were born in England, is that correct? That's correct. Yeah. Uh, and uh, after his undergraduate degrees, he uh, went to Cambridge uh, to do his PhD and uh, remained there for a long time until he came to UCSD in the 90s uh, for about 10 years. A little longer. <laughs> a little longer. Um, so at least a, at least a decade uh, to mechanical and aerospace engineering, although a lot of the work that, that Paul has done has had uh, application to the oceans. So uh, while Paul, Paul was here, um, he had a lot of connection with people here at, here at Scripps. <coughs> we didn't really collaborate uh, until he was about to leave. And uh, this, was the, this was the time of the great financial collapse of 2008. And when the Obama administration came in, um, they actually gave NSF money uh, for shovel-ready instrumentation. Um, so instead of having an annual cycle for major research instrumentation, they had, a, they had two cycles in one year as a part of the Recovery Act. And uh, Paul and I collaborated on writing a proposal for uh, what we now call the Modular Airborne Sensing System, a, a package of instruments that Luke uh, and others in my lab uh, put together to fly uh, and do uh, airborne, ocean, uh, sorry, airborne oceanography and also uh, airborne measurements of uh, terrestrial uh, processes in the built environment, uh, which Paul has done a lot of work in. There was one other, in, in thinking about introducing Paul, there was one other uh, thing I think I should mention, and that is, I remember at a meeting with Paul, I'm not sure whether it was myself or one of my students was presenting some work on breaking waves, and Paul said, I think there must be something deeper, or I think you might be able to go a bit further. Uh, and I actually went back and looked at the problem, um, and indeed, we, we could go further, and that's opened up a whole new branch of research for us in the last decade. So, whether you knew what you were saying or not, Paul, <laughs> certainly not. Um, I think I, I might owe you a, a big thank you for just stressing the importance of always making sure that you go a little bit deeper in, in what you're doing in your research. So. Um, Paul is back in Cambridge, and uh, fortunately he was able to make uh, this trip here combined with, with other work in, in California, so it's a great pleasure to have you here. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you very much for that uh, kind introduction, Ken. Uh, it's a great pleasure uh, for me to be here uh, and uh, to talk on this very special occasion. Uh, Ken probably doesn't know this, but actually he was a big factor in my coming to UCSD in the first place. Uh, after I was uh, offered the job, I came back with my family to uh, have a look and, and decide whether it really was the place to move to. And, um, and Ken and I walked out on Scripps Pier one day uh, during this visit. Uh, and uh, I was very interested to get his views about uh, moving to uh, this part of the world coming from an older institution uh, which he had done from MIT and I was <coughs> contemplating doing coming from Cambridge and how it would be to deal with the American funding scene and so forth. And, and Ken gave me uh, uh, a lot of good advice uh, and in particular I think uh, uh, made it clear, well both by what he said but perhaps more by his example that you can make a success of this kind of move. Uh, and I think it was uh, that and the fact that we did have this shared experience of growing up in Australia and being educated there and then coming to a foreign country and, and in his case succeeding so well that gave me some confidence that perhaps this wasn't such a foolish move to, uh, to cross the Atlantic and come here. And I must say that uh, as a result of that, uh, myself and my family and my wife in particular, we spent 12 very happy years here and it was a fantastic time and, uh, uh, and while I'm uh, not sorry to be back in Cambridge I do miss 
uh, this part of the world and my colleagues here and friends and, it's, and so it's very nice to return on this very special occasion. And as Ken said, uh, I, I was a little surprised when uh, Fabrice, uh, I, I, he, he said, you know, sent around this notice and I said, I may well be in California that week. And he said, well, would you like to give a talk? And I thought, well, I've never worked with Ken specifically, except we do have this one joint paper, which I think is the latest, on, at least on your web page, it's your latest publication, I don't know what it is. And it's certainly the one that I have the most co-authors with. It's a long list of authors, and my contribution is even smaller than the fraction, uh, if you divided the paper, <coughs> all the co-authors. Mine is even smaller than, than all of that. Uh, but anyway, it still a, it's still been a pleasure to interact with him, and I've admired Ken's work over the years. Um, Walter asked if anyone had known G.I. Taylor, uh, and I knew G.I. Taylor. When I first went to Cambridge as a PhD student in 1969, G.I. was still around. He didn't come into the department very often. He'd really stopped doing research at that point. And I was far too shy uh, and uh, felt far less, very too uni to really speak to him. But I did occasionally sit down in the damped common room uh, in the periphery of him and hear him speak to other people. But uh, So I did sort of in some sense meeting, but not perhaps greatly. But, but, um, but my career has been very strongly influenced by him. And I would say I'd like to echo Walter's remarks that I think Ken has, uh, has a broad range of interests from the lab to calculations to field work that uh, exemplifies, I think, a great, uh, a great scientist. So I'm going to talk about some work that we're currently doing. Uh, we have uh, uh, a grant uh, from the Engineering and Physical Sciences Research Council in the UK on stratified turbulence. Uh, and I'm going to talk about a small part of this work. This is actually a joint, uh, <coughs> a joint activity between Cambridge uh, and Bristol <coughs> and uh, involves a number of colleagues uh, in Cambridge, including John Taylor, who's sitting in the audience here, uh, and Colin Caulfield, who many of you will know is uh, here with me in MAE, um, and uh, some others as we go through. And I'm going to talk about some work carried out by my current research student, Adrienne Lefavre, uh, and a postdoc who was my previous research student, the first one I had when I went back to Cambridge, Jamie Partridge, and Stuart Diel. Um, and uh, I'm going to talk about uh, stratified turbulence, uh, because it's a very important problem in oceanography and meteorology. Uh, we want to understand how fluids mix when uh, buoyancy forces are important, uh, when density differences are important. Uh, and we know that uh, this mixing, because uh, it involves a change in the, in the density of the fluid particles, has to occur ultimately on very small scales where molecular processes can act. So we know uh, if we measure large-scale fields, what we want to, want to be able to do is to predict the mixing rates that are in processes that occur in <coughs> much smaller scale than we're actually able to, uh, to, to measure in, in the field. And uh, so this has been a, a motivation for much work over many years, uh, and uh, I'm going to talk about some aspects of that. Uh, at the, one of the classical pictures we all have in our mind, I think, when we think about mixing in a, in a shear flow in any, in any case where you have uh, fluid traveling in different directions uh, at uh, different uh, uh, in different uh, different directions so here this is the famous experiment by Steve Thorpe uh, where he takes this tank of two layers of fluid of different density a heavy dark one guide here and a light uh, uh, light one uh, on top and tilting the tank, the heavy fluid runs downhill and the light fluid runs uphill. And the shear flow at some point goes unstable and generates these very beautiful Kelvin Helmholtz uh, billows, uh, which were analyzed uh, uh, much, much earlier theoretically. Uh, and you can see this very characteristic roll up. And these have been observed in the atmosphere. Uh, so clouds showing features very similar uh, to these. And uh, these pictures here show something similar here rolling up. This is a time sequence from one, two, three, four, five. You can see this uh, line of dye rolling up. These are famous photographs taken by John Woods in the Mediterranean, uh, just laying some dye down and then, and then photographing them. So we see this kind of process taking place in the atmosphere and the ocean, and we want to understand what goes on here and whether this is really uh, 
how critical this is. And just so uh, you see how it happens in practice, this is a reproduction of this experiment. Uh, here's the two layers, and you can see that uh, this wave did occur and how much did it break. They become very three dimensional, so this flow is going down here and up in this direction, and you get this very rapid uh, break up and the three dimensional <coughs> structure, lots of fine scale, and that's sort of where the mixing takes place. So we've learned a lot about that from those kinds of experiments. Uh, and recently, uh, so over the last uh, so 10 to 15 years, we've been reanalyzing some of the scaling in stratified uh, turbulence. This actually goes right back to the 80s by Doug Lilly. Um, and I don't expect you to go through this, uh, through this uh, slide. I just want to point out two important parameters. So if you think of a flow with some uh, density gradient specified by a buoyancy frequency n, you can construct a fruit number based on the speed of the flow n and a horizontal length scale, and a Reynolds number uh, also based on the speed of the flow uh, and the same horizontal scale uh, and the kinematic viscosity. So I'm not the vertical scale, as you might think uh, initially. And if you do that scaling, uh, what you find when you, when you non-dimensionalize the equation is that uh, there are two terms that balance. One is this inertial uh, term here, uh, and the other term here is this uh, viscous term. Uh, and uh, the point is that uh, strong stratification occurs when this term is small, uh, um, and, but, uh, and it's turbulent when the Reynolds number is large. And in fact, it's this product of these two quantities, as you can see from here and here, that, that, that determines the strength of this viscous term. <coughs> this uh, quantity is known as the buoyancy Reynolds number. It's actually the product of this Reynolds number and this horizontal root number squared. And this is an important, very important parameter. And in fact, it was recognized by Carl Gibson way back in 1980 as an important parameter if you do the following scaling. So if you write this Reynolds number like this and the square of the root number like that and collect the terms up, you can identify this term, u cubed over this horizontal scale, as a measure of the dissipation in a turbulent flow, which would be true if it was homogeneous, it may not be true if it's stratified, but if you believe that, uh, and then you're left with 1 over mu n squared, you get this quantity epsilon over mu n squared, which Carl uh, identified as an important parameter in determining whether ocean uh, structures were vigorously turbulent or not. Uh, and uh, he pointed out that really, unless this number was bigger than a number like 80, uh, uh, then, you, then the viscous effects were really important. And uh, the history of lab experiments, I think, is somewhat plagued by this, by this issue. So we are very motivated, we have been very motivated by trying to, to understand the weights behind submarines for obvious defense reasons. Uh, and this, is, this has, uh, I think, dominated much of what we've done in the lab uh, over the years. So Jeff Stein uh, showed some of his early experiments of dragging uh, a sphere through a stratified fluid. And you look down in plan view here. Uh, it doesn't really matter, but what you see over time are these uh, strong vortices that are produced. You're looking down on the flow. Uh, very horizontal pancake-like structures, not much in the vertical. Uh, and if you measure uh, this uh, buoyancy Reynolds number here, and these are actually more, much more recent uh, uh, experiments done uh, higher Reynolds numbers, you find very quickly, in almost all cases, and this is nt equals 1, so one buoyancy period, uh, the numbers are down around 10. So in most of these experiments, I would argue, in these experiments certainly, and in much of what we've done on stratified flows, uh, the buoyancy realms numbers are small. It's very hard to imagine these are really turbulent in the sense that viscosity doesn't matter. So I think this is a really big problem. Uh, and uh, so we've been trying to think about how to get around it. And uh, when we wrote this proposal, we were going to do a very elaborate experiment with stratified shear flow with uh, lane of correct things. Uh, and uh, while I was writing, while we were sort of writing the proposal, it occurred to me that we could, might do something much simpler, something you could do in your own home. Just take a tank of uh, water, a tank, divide it in two, and stick a pipe from one side to the other, and put salt, water, or dense fluid on one side and, and 
fresh water or life fluid on the other side. Uh, and then just open the tube and let the flow go from one side to the other. Uh, so the heavy fluid runs from the left to the right and the light fluid runs from right to left. So this is like Steve Thought's experiment, except it keeps going. So it doesn't just do its initial instability, but this will keep going as long as you can continue to supply fluid from the two reservoirs. Uh, and uh, you, you might think this has been done before, and the answer is, well, it has, but it's only been done when theta is zero, when this is horizontal, except in one case, which was a PhD student, as far as I know, anyway, one case, a PhD student in Cambridge in engineering, uh, who did it uh, uh, for, for angles which basically went from zero uh, to 90 degrees, uh, but he really missed all, in my opinion, all the interesting stuff which happens when the angle is at just a few degrees. Um, so the horizontal case is one example, uh, and the tilted case is uh, another. So this is what we did. So we've done experiments uh, in a, a, big, uh, a big tube, 10 by 10 centimeters cross section, three meters long. Uh, I'm going to mainly talk about experiments in a smaller tube, which I'll show you in a minute, which is about half as big, so just under five centimeters square. Uh, and uh, it's, it's a stratified inclined duct, so we call it SID, uh, and we have a large SID and a mini SID. Uh, so these two things, and we, and we have uh, to change the density difference, and we can change the angle, and we can change the geometry. Uh, and the way I've drawn this is where theta is positive, the flow is accelerated, so the heavy fluid is accelerated down here, and the light fluid is accelerated up here. So this is the picture of the current uh, smaller version. Uh, as I said, it couldn't be a simpler experiment. You just take this tank, put a wall in it, uh, and, uh, and put your uh, tube, your duct inside. Uh, and we just have a flexible membrane so we can tilt it. And this is Adrian, who's uh, currently... Uh, Smile through the camera. Sorry? Smile through the camera. Smile through the camera. This is uh, currently Adrian, who is uh, working on this as my PhD student. So the flow generates, as I've, uh, as I've described, vertical stratification and vertical shear. It uh, has steady sustained forcing and I think that's really important. I think in many circumstances the idea that this flow starts from some initial value problem like the thought experiment and then does something and it's all over I think is of course interesting but I think there are many circumstances <coughs> in nature where the forcing is much more in some sense steady even if it's forced by shear from an internal wave, the period of the internal wave can be long compared to the turnover time and the mixing. Uh, there are flows from estuaries, I'll show you an example, where the, where the shear is sustained, so I think that really matters. Uh, as I said, interesting things happen for small angles. And if you work out the buoyancy Reynolds numbers for these experiments, they're between 100 and 1,000. So we're up around numbers that are relevant to the ocean. Viscous effects are not important. And you'll see how that works in a minute. Okay, uh, and as I said, there are uh, dimensionless parameters, so there's obviously the aspect ratio of the, of the duct, the angle of the tilt, and some measure of the density difference. I'm going to use the Atwood number for the time being. For those of you who like uh, to use G prime or reduced gravity, uh, this is uh, 2 G A. So A is the density difference divided by the sum of the densities. Okay, so what are we seeing? Get my movies to work. I'll tell you. Here we go. All right. So uh, look at just look at the top panel for now. So this is the interface, and we can have a situation where, in fact, we're retarding the flow, and the interface basically doesn't move at all. It's essentially a laminar flow, uh, and nothing happens. It's really boring. I'm not going to talk about that anymore. If you get close to the horizontal, you can see the interface now starts to have some instabilities on it. Uh, you can see these characteristic cusp-like waves. Uh, this is characteristic of a Holmbo mode of instability on the interface. I'm sorry, I'm having <coughs> trouble with my movies in this, <coughs> in this stupid beam up thing. So you can see these cusp-like uh, modes. The interface stays pretty sharp still, but there are occasional wisps of fluid that get carried away. As I said, very characteristic of a Holmbo instability. And if I make this angle even larger and it one more time. What, what was the density difference? Uh, well, I, I don't know the answer to that question, sorry. Um, in this particular case, it's, a, it's 
you know, a few percent. You can see that if I drive it very hard, I get fine scale sustained turbulence the whole time. And this is essentially steady. Okay. Now, as I said, my next movie doesn't work at all. If anyone can solve the problems, I really need to know how to do that. So I'm going to try and show you another movie. Okay. And we get other situations where we get this sort of striated uh, structure. Uh, and uh, uh, we just have to watch it over time. Remember, this is not, nothing is changing in the reservoirs here, so this is just <coughs> the, uh, the flow just carrying on uh, with the same conditions at each end of the tube. And then you see the occasional burst of turbulence like this in here. Uh, and Do you have end effects? Uh, I'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, and you see here another little burst, and then, oh, well, it's changing altogether, right? It changes into this much more, kind of more like the fully turbulent state. And then, because I can't show you it speed it up, let's go along a bit. Here somewhere, we go back to something not quite the same, but, but actually much more of the sort of more of this original striated state, and then it'll go through this cycle over and over again. Okay. So in these circumstances, we end up with with the spatial and temporal periodic flows, uh, spatial and temporal uh, intermittent flows. <coughs> Hold on. In in this intermittent state, which I was supposed to show you there, but I can't get it to you. So we can plot this out in the state space to this uh, system. So here is the density difference increasing as you go up, and here is the angle increasing as you go up. And we go through these four states, the laminar state, boring state that I'm not going to talk about, at low angle or negative angles and uh, low density differences, through the Hombo modes, which occur pretty much when the duct is horizontal and have been observed and studied a lot by Greg Lawrence and his group. Then if we go to large angles and large density differences, we get this fully turbulent state, and in between here we get this <coughs> intermittent, spatially and temporally intermittent state. And what I want to do partly is to explain what's going on in that situation. Okay, so the first thing you can do is to measure the velocities of the layers, uh, and uh, this is what's done here. These are the average velocities of each layer uh, uh, for a given, and each of these different uh, Colors represent a different angle, uh, and they're plotted against g prime square root of g prime h, the usual buoyancy velocity, and they all fall on straight lines. Okay, so the velocities scale like the square root of g prime h. Okay, so what's going on? All right, so uh, let's let's take the case uh, where the flow is uh, horizontal, as I said, this is <coughs> uh, by Greg Lawrence and others. Uh, and uh, what you expect then, uh, and this comes back to what uh, Jim just said, is that the flow actually is hydraulically controlled at the two ends. There's actually flow out of the end, the flow becomes supercritical, and there's a, there's a fixed fruit number at one end and the same thing at the other end. Uh, and if that's the case, then essentially, uh, because it's horizontal, it's, it's just driven by the pressure difference between the two ends in the reservoir, so this, this term is zero, uh, so basically, you end up with a hydraulic control which says that the sum of the fruit numbers of the two layers is one. And because the flow is symmetric, uh, this, this means that each of these is one over the square root of two, if there was no dissipation. Okay? Uh, and uh, what you find, uh, if, you, if you look at uh, this earlier work, uh, and you take into account uh, uh, dissipation, uh, you find typical numbers are somewhat less than 0.7. And we can plot our results on this in this way. So this is the crude number here on this axis, plotted against angle. So now, as I said, since the velocity scales like this, for each angle, we get a number here. Uh, so horizontally, we're getting numbers that are low compared to 0.7. This is 1 over root 2 here. Uh, so you can see that so the velocities are, uh, the fruit numbers are small. And as I increase the angle, the fruit numbers increase and then asymptote up to this value, which you'd expect if there was no dissipation in the system. Okay. So what's happening is that, uh, that as, we, uh, as, we tilt the, as we tilt the tube, 
uh, we're doing work by gravity up and down the slope, and that's putting energy into the system. And when that's enough to overcome the dissipation in the system, then the controls at the two ends keep everything fixed now, uh, and you go and just behave like it's a dissipationless, hydraulically controlled two-layer flow in the system. Uh, and uh, uh, you can calculate actually when that happens. That happens when the when the the buoyancy force associated with the long slope acceleration is comparable with the pressure difference due to the two ends of the, of the, of the, um, so the duct in the two reservoir. And if you do the, if you do the mass, uh, this number comes out to be about half a degree. So when you get to over a half a degree or so, well, half a degree is here, so you're getting up close already by the time you're at one or so degrees, uh, then then the, do the a long slope flow is dominating everything <coughs> in this particular case. Okay. So, uh, so, so, so what's happening is, is that we, is a, as we tilt this harder and harder, we're putting more and more energy into the system. Uh, and of course, since the flow can't go any faster because the velocity is limited by the fluid number, the energy has to be dissipated in the system. And so the harder you push it, it has to go to a more and more dissipated state. And that's why you get the transition from the lamina to the hombo to the intermittent to the fully curved. Okay, and let's just try and quantify that. So, uh, in fact, as I mentioned, Darwin Keel did his experiments uh, in, in, in engineering in Cambridge, and it's not, never been published. Uh, but he defined this essentially geometric Richardson number. So he says, okay, you're putting in a certain amount of kinetic energy. Uh, associated with this uh, long slope uh, component of gravity, g prime sine theta, uh, and you can say how you compare that with the potential energy of the system, uh, g prime cos theta times h is the inverse of the pan of the slope. Uh, and uh, if we look at the buoyancy Reynolds number, coming back to this uh, uh, parameter I introduced before, this is the dissipation, a rate of dissipation, so it's the dissipation over the transit time divided by mu n squared. And the dissipation is the energy that you have to, is that you're, is that you're including, so g prime l sine theta uh, divided by the transit time, which is l over the velocity. And if you do all of this, it turns out to be uh, essentially uh, the product or, or, or the ratio or the Reynolds number now based on the depth of the channel uh, divided by this parameter here, which is essentially uh, n theta. Okay? Uh, and so we can go back and rescale our we look at our data uh, in state space, now plotting uh, this along the Reynolds number on this axis uh, and this uh, parameter, uh, 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 this geometric parameter here, and you can see that the transition from the hombo to the intermittent, or from the intermittent to the turbulent, are along lines of where this is constant. So they're lines of constant buoyancy Reynolds number, uh, and you can see the numbers, right? So you go from this hombo state to, uh, to an intermittent state of a number around 50, and you go to the fully turbulent state uh, when the number is around 100. And remember, Carl Gibson said it had to be 80, so pretty close. Um, and, uh, and I think it's clear then what, what the physics of this situation is. Okay, so time for more movies. So we've also looked a little more at some of these structures. So this is a these are, these are visualizations of the density field. This is on a horizontal plane uh, along the center of the tank. Uh, and again, I'm showing you Hombo. Uh, in fact, this is a spatially intermittent bit. Uh, and, then the, and then the fully turning the case. So now you're actually visualizing the density field. So you can see this very sharp transition in the Hombo mode. Uh, these kind of turbulence around the edges of this, uh, of this uh, in the intermittent case. And then lots of mixing and obvious vigorous stuff going on there. <coughs> I'm not going to do that anymore. <coughs> what were the little blue specks in they the bottom? They were bubbles. Yeah. Uh, and we can also measure the velocity field from PID. Uh, and what you see are long, streaky structures. This is the vorticity in this direction, out of the board. And so you, so you see, uh, yeah, that's driving me nuts. Okay. Should we pass a hat and buy Kinemac? Yeah. <laughs> and so, uh, 
So you get these long bridging structures, which I'll come back to in a minute. So this is all in 2D, and we realised that actually, uh, and, uh, and so that's just another example of that. So what you see on the shadow graph, that's what I showed you on the original movies in the blue. Uh, this is the density field for the Hombo, uh, the intermittent case, and then the vorticity structure. You can see these vortices which actually sit outside the, the interface uh, in, the, in the Hombo case. Uh, in the intermittent case, there's some structure here. And then in the fully turbulent case, you can see the strong vortex structures across the whole of this transition region between the two layers. So generation of more fine scale uh, as the flow becomes more and more turbulent, more and more dissipative in each case. But these are just 2D, and we know the structure is 3D. And so we're now in the process of beginning to look at this problem in 3D. Uh, so uh, I've lost track of the time. You've got, you've got plenty of time. I was here. Oh, okay. I'll stop. Okay. Fine. Thank you. All right. Okay. So we're now starting to look at this uh, property in, in 3D, uh, uh, and I'm just going to give you a, a brief uh, taste of, of this of what we what we're doing. So basically, uh, we're using simultaneous uh, particle image fellow symmetry. So we seed uh, the the flow uh, with small particles. Uh, and we also dye uh, one of the solutions with uh, rhodamine dye. Uh, and then we look at the flow, uh, we illuminate the vertical plane with a laser sheet down the center of the, uh, the vertical plane, sorry, down the center of the duct, looking from above. Uh, and we, we look at it with three cameras. So <coughs> two outside cameras uh, look at the particles uh, and, uh, and take two images at, on the plane at uh, different times and from that calculate the velocity field in the usual way. And the middle camera uh, looks at the dye. We have different filters on the cameras, uh, so we, we just see the dye concentration, or from that we get the density, and we can do that uh, simultaneously. All right, so on a single plane, we can get three components of velocity with the, two, with the two cameras, and we get the density field. And then we march the plane across the volume. How wide was the tank? Uh, five centimeters, the tube, the duct is five centimeters. Now this is down to the genius of Stuart DL uh, that we're able to do this. Um, uh, and in the current setup, we just do 25 uh, scans across the width, and we essentially march uh, across a forward scan and then across a backward scan as time goes on. And we get this information then, over, not instantaneously, but close to instantaneously over a whole volume. And I think uh, uh, this is, uh, I think this is a really great uh, system that, uh, that Stuart has built. Um, it's really, uh, it sounds simple, but actually it's very complicated. Uh, when you drive the, when you drive the uh, laser sheet across, uh, to do PIV, you have to take uh, two images at different times in the same place. Uh, and. Uh, and you, you can't stop and start the traverse because it would just shake uh, and everything goes wrong, so it has to move smoothly. And so what he does, and this is my, our postdoc, Jamie, who actually is a nice guy despite the... <laughs> um, ...is that we have these two mirrors uh, that, uh, that we control to within a micron radian. Uh, and from that, as the traverse moves forward, uh, the light sheet flashes here, and then when the true reverse is over here, the mirrors flip it back to where it was uh, before, and you take the second image as the traverse moves on. It's amazing. And these mirrors are what you use for light shows and stuff like that. They're very cheap, uh, and you can control them with amazing accuracy. Uh, but it's taken us a year to make it work. So, and this is the kind of thing you see. So here is an isodensity surface uh, for a Hombo situation. And we're looking kind of obliquely down on the interface, and we really just in, just look at one ISO surface, and you can see the sort of cuspy nature of the Hondo <coughs> mode, but you can also see that it's not uniform across the cross section of the duct, and there is significant three-dimensional structure here uh, that we're sort of beginning to explore. You can also uh, superimpose so that here is that ISO surface. Again, uh, and then we can look, for example, at streamlines in a single vertical plane in this particular case. Uh, so you can mark, uh, so the flow is going like this. You can see the streamlines here, and you can see the vortex structures 
on the top here associated with the, with the, with the vorticity that's responsible for, for, for distorting the interface in the home boat instability. So we're really beginning to look carefully at some of these uh, three-dimensional effects. And here is another example, to, again, looking at the Hondo uh, case. And again, you can see, so you, this is, these are sequences in time, so you can see that this crest uh, moves at a constant speed uh, uh, along the interface, but it doesn't stay here, it's in the middle, and it starts to move over to the back side, and it's right against the wall here. So we're not, we're not seeing these things going straight, but actually across the cross section at the same time. So we're just beginning to explore this, but clearly the three dimensional features are really important, and understanding how they fit into the dynamics is important. Uh, here is another example which is characteristic more of the intermittent case. Uh, so where, as I said, I showed you the images where there's a sort of instability is more on the top and bottom, and there's a kind of a region in the middle which is more well mixed. And again, you can see uh, here are these sort of custody structures. Uh, and again, significant cross-stream variation uh, from one to the other. So this is, I think, absolutely fascinating, and we're just beginning uh, to get to grips with all of that. OK. Uh, and uh, this was the movie that so I couldn't get to last for long enough. But I wanted to make the point here that this is what we see uh, on a single vertical plane, and we don't know yet what the three-dimensional structure of this is like. This is still a pattern as we speak. Um, uh, and all I wanted to do uh, was to point out the, the similarity to uh, st structures seen from acoustic backscatter uh, in the Connecticut River estuary by Rocky Geyer and people of the Pole. Um, and as I said in my, in my earlier <coughs> remarks, uh, you know, I think there are many circumstances where the flow is forced continuously, uh, and, uh, and that's certainly true here. The outflowing river flows up, up above the saltier seawater, and this shear is maintained for a long time. And what you see are these long structures in the acoustic backscatter, which are measurements of the, essentially the fine structure in the density field. And we see, I'm sorry, I can never get the arrows to go the right way, but you see the same things, essentially very similar structures here. Uh, in, the, in, this, in this experiment. And this is quite different from starting an initial value problem and letting it <coughs> I mean, you know, that's, I mean, there, it's important, but that, this is really different. And I think, you know, the way these mix uh, density across this, uh, across this channel will be quite different from a roll-up in a sort of big Kelvin hell holes below. So it's important to understand. And, and, you know, what you're seeing here is this region of high vorticity. So the velocity is actually doing this in here, you know, going like this, but the water is coming out of here. So there's lots of shear in this long structure. Right? So that is really being strained uh, by the shear. You create long filaments like this, uh, which then break off associated with the shear flow. So a very fascinating uh, uh, structure in here. Okay. So uh, we've so what we've seen so far is that we've achieved what I think is a statistically steady turbulent flow at high buoyancy Reynolds numbers. Uh, the mean velocities uh, so scale so that everything is hydraulically controlled uh, at the ends of the duct, uh, and the flow becomes turbulent, fully turbulent, at a critical buoyancy round number of around about uh, 100. Uh, and what's happening is that that is dissipating this excess kinetic energy that's being put into the put into the flow by the long slope component gravity. Uh, and we're just beginning to look. Uh, at the three-dimensional structure uh, of, the, of, these, of these flows. And I'll tell you more about the turbulent case on another occasion when we got around to measuring it. And I said at the beginning that uh, mixing takes place on very small scales by molecular processes. Uh, and these are all done in salt. So there's another question, which is, well, what about the Prampton number? Okay, so many simulations are done at Prandtl number one. Uh, so the Prandtl number, or the Schmidt number, uh, for salt water is 700. Okay, so not very close to one. Uh, and so what happens? So we did some experiments with temperature, which has a Prandtl number of seven. Okay, and uh, this is what you see. 
so it transitions to turbulence, the decay away almost completely to laminar flow, another transition to turbulence, the decay away to almost completely laminar flow. This is the intermittent text. Okay. So it looks very different from the you can get a good view of the intermittency, but the structure looks quite different from the intermittency we saw in the salt case. So let's look at the let's look at the regime diagram. So this is what I showed you before. So this is the Reynolds number here, this uh, geometric, which is the number here, and the transitions that I showed you at a constant points here, Reynolds number. And you see something very similar qualitatively in the salt in the heat case. Uh, you can see that these lines are essentially parallel, but they're not <coughs> in the same place. So there's a difference in the, in, in the, you see the same regimes, you see each of the regimes as before, uh, but the numbers are not quite the same. Qualitatively, uh, you would say that's the same, the same in this context, in the sense that the ones up in high, high uh, Reynolds number and uh, the Low values of the geometric resistance number are totally the same as two here, but the numbers <coughs> match up completely. So, so the transition to these different scales is somewhat different. And if you look at, for example, the intermittent case, you can see that it actually looks quite different. So this is what I showed you on the last movie, uh, slightly different uh, visualization. This is temperature, uh, and you see a transition to a turbulent state. This is this is time. And this is height, so you see a turbulent region, a relatively laminar region, a turbulent region, a relatively laminar region, and so on. And it's pretty periodic. In the salt case, uh, it's a bit hard to see here, but actually it's much more irregular and doesn't have this, doesn't relaminarize in any way the same way as it does in the temperature case. And the Reynolds numbers of these flows are pretty similar, actually. So the conditions are pretty similar. And if you look at some of the details of the Flow, you also see uh, that they look somewhat different uh, in each of the cases. This is a little difficult to know because we dyed this uh, heat, heat stratified case, so we're not sure the dye and the temperature are behaving the same. Here. And so just take this with a grain of salt. And certainly, this time variability is quite different in the two cases. And uh, as I said, uh, John, who's sitting here, uh, and uh, our postdoc G have been doing uh, uh, calculations uh, and we've been comparing uh, temperature uh, calculations with uh, uh, so these are DNS runs uh, showing the evolution over time of this uh, shear flow uh, for a, a parameter number of seven and then we've, we've invented a new material uh, called mythical unknown stuff <laughs> uh, which has the same acronym as our project uh, and uh, uh, with a parameter number of 70, uh, which doesn't correspond to anything. Uh, and you can see even there with a tenfold increase in the, uh, in the parameter number that there's a significant difference in the structure uh, at later times. So we hope that 70 is high and that you don't have to do 700 because the resolution is very difficult, of course, uh, to do that. Uh, but we don't know yet and we're still... This is an area that we're still working on. I think we're, we're increasingly of the opinion that stratificate, that uh, molecular effects do matter, even uh, when you're using relatively low renaissance, as you can see. Uh, but we think from our experiments that actually this may be a, a really important problem in the future. And so I think it's, you know, it's a, in a sense a challenge to people doing DNS that you, I think it's important to get the molecular properties right and not just use Pratt number equals one. Okay. Are these 2D or 3D? These are 3D. So they're expensive. Mm -hmm. We're still, I think, I think G's still running the 700, is that right? <laughs> yeah. Okay, so I want to, that, that's all I want to say really. Uh, I was looking for photographs of Ken, I don't have many, but I do have these two. Uh, they were taken at uh, my 60th birthday party. Um, here in La Jolla, uh, and um, uh, obviously uh, they've just been at one of my talks and are wondering what the hell it was about. <laughs> 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 I'd like to see 
and uh, I hope that you don't feel quite the same uh, about this talk. And uh, I'd like to offer you my warmest congratulations and say happy birthday. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Well, I think, I think that was a rather interesting talk and shows what you can do with lab experiments. Um, so questions? Can I ask you a good question? Yeah. Did you try incorporating the theta, the angle, into G? It's in G. G sine theta. Yeah. Oh, you got it in there. Yeah. It was nice. The second yeah. thing is there's a lot of field data available for all this. Did you compare any of the two there? From where? Myself and other people. Both with salt and with temperature in Lake Tineret and salt estuaries. It'd be really interesting to see how the scaling goes. Yeah, it would. Using the portable flux probe model. Okay, okay. Yates is the first oil there. Yeah, I know. Okay. That would be useful to know. No, I haven't really done that in detail. That's right. Let's yeah. get to get out Okay. Still. So, I mean, you talk about the importance of molecular processes. If you go back to your initial discussion about the Reynolds number, the argument was it has to be big enough so that we can neglect and use as no physics. Right. And the other results, the only compare salt and heat are a bit alarming because does this mean that there's a mythical high on the state or that actually you can never get rid of the influence of viscosity because you scale with these transition lines and they seem to depend on the frontal number. Mm -hmm. But if the frontal number is super big, will they become independent frontal number? <coughs> I would, maybe. Yeah, because I think yeah, you should really talk about the Peckley number, I think. Uh, so the Prandtl number with, I mean the Reynolds number with, with molecular diffusivity in the, in the denominator. Um, and I think that's an interesting question because the, the Peckley number for salt is actually much higher than the Reynolds number, so to speak. You know, so one would imagine that it's, yeah, it's hard to see why it's important. So, yeah, I don't think I know the answer to that question. It's, it's so a concern. It has enormous implications for what you ask for the plankton succession, because they care about the vaginal scale. Yeah, so this, you know, that's what this is. <laughs> yeah, we've now yeah. shown that plankton succession totally depends on it. Yeah. 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 Paula? Yes, I mean, in both your lab experiment and John's simulation, it seemed like the big difference in the two granular numbers case was that the scale of mixing was larger for the larger Yeah, I'm not sure. I'm, I wouldn't say the mixing is greater at greater power number. No, but, but it's, it's not on the scale. The scale in the sense of the... Well, the scale is actually is large. The vertical scale is larger at... I mean, the vertical scale, the region over which the mixing took place, the vertical scale of that turbulence, is actually larger at lower parameter. Larger for heat than for salt. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Sorry. Uh, well, uh, very nice. So when you increase the forcing and by increasing the angle uh, of inclination of, of the duct, uh, do the inc inclination of these structures over which the mixing is going on, these thin, intense vertical structures, do, does that angle also asymptote to something? I don't, I don't know, actually. Um, uh, I think we haven't looked at that carefully enough to know the answer to that question. I, yeah, so I don't know. Um, I mean, we, the problem is that, that we're really working on a relatively small range of angles, so, and they're not straight, so it's hard to know, you know, they vary a bit and they're kind of comparable to the, the tilt, but you know, if the tilt's only two degrees, <coughs> some of them are close to horizontal, some of them are four degrees, it's hard to know. So in the intermittent case, right, mm -hmm. does boundary turbulence play any role in sparking off the turbulence in the core of the shirley? I don't think so. Uh, I don't think so. No. Uh, I mean, there is, there are some. I mean, yeah. It may be that the, that some of it is initiated at the inlet, and that's kind of what uh, Jim was was implying. And we do sometimes see. Uh, we do sometimes see stuff starting at the inlet and propagating through. 
but other times that appears not to be the case. It appears to arise spontaneously somewhere in the interior. Um, yeah, so I, I don't, I mean, I think, I don't think it plays a role, but we're still... But then I was trying to play Chandler's law experiments, as trying to play atmosphere modular in the lab type experiments, right? Echolier experiments. Oftentimes, this intermittent state was sparked by ejections from the boundary layer. Well, it I think it depends on the boundary conditions to some extent. So if you're, I mean, if, if you're doing flux boundary conditions, here, you know, the, it's different, I think. And, it, and it, it depends whether the forcing is coming from, here the forcing is not coming from the boundary. The forcing is coming from the shear at the center, right? um, primarily. Yeah. So. so I think you can continue that conversation over coffee? Okay.